Hi, in this video, I'm going to talk about survival ensembles, in particular, taking a survival model and ensembling it with a classification model and see if we can get some synergy, uh, higher accuracy by blending both of these models together and assembling them together. As with all my videos, there is a, the, you know, the, the content, uh, the material, the code, and a lot of links are on my blog. So it's amunategi.github.io, and this is called Survival Ensembles, Survival Plus Classification for Improved Time-Based Predictions in R. So whenever you're, you're looking at, um, you, you, your data set has a time-based element, and you're trying to predict something happening at, uh, you know, over, uh, at, at a particular uh, at some time or over different times, then survival model is a great model to, to, to help you do that as it's going to return a, a large amount of periods and tell you the probability of that event of something happening over uh, all of those periods. The, a lot of our model, other models can, can give you that kind of information as well. I'm thinking the regression model can definitely you know, predict a time period. The problem is you have to add a second model to get whether the, the outcome happened or not on top of it. So there's two models. That's why we're not going to look at regressions here. Uh, classification won't give you the time period, but if you, you tell it within the next 30 days, some, it will something happen, then you, know, you can create an outcome uh, variable that says within the next period of 30 days, if it happens, it's one. If not, it's zero. And then you're getting a probability of something happening over the next 30 days. And that's what we're going to do here. So we're going to look at both of those models. In terms of the data, we're going to use a data set from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. It's an AIDS clinical trial study, and it's the biggest data set I could find. And it's just very hard to find large uh, data sets for survival uh, modeling in the public domain. This one isn't bad. Um, let's see. I'm just going to load it in memory right now, and we can look at it. Here we have it. So if I do a look at do a head on it, you'll see a survival model needs two um, outcome variables. It needs a time-based element, and you need to have a time-based element for every single observation in your data, and a sensor, some kind of event. And that is a little bit more uh, loose. It could be either the event has happened or we don't know, right? Which is kind of a, a contrast to the classification model, where you either it's true or false. There's no I don't know state. And that's what I'm hoping really bringing uh, th these two different worlds together and seeing how it can help us. It also has a time and a sensor. And the time is, um, the, these are a, a list of HIV patients and it's a time to AIDS or death. Uh, so um, th this is the time element and whether uh, they've reached that event or not. So here, this the first one did not uh, reach it. There's also one, there's also a second set of time underscore D, sensor underscore D, and that's just time to death, not whether the AIDS diagnosis is just death. So we are going to only going to work with the first one because it's a little bit more balanced of a data set. And we're going to, thus, you're going to have to remove these from when you're working with data set, otherwise you'd be peaking and you would get, you know, um, artificially high uh, uh, accuracy. We're going to, um, so here, I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to remove all the these two, time underscore d, sensor underscore d, and we're just going to work with these values here. Okay. Here, a quick plot. We're going to look at a, at a plot of the data set here. And these are, uh, you know, every single one of the observations and the times when um, the study was made for each one of these patients. So you see the time varies from zero, uh, zero days to 300 and 350 days, right? I think it's got a thousand and some. Uh, 1151 observations, so patients. I'm not going to talk much about the, the theory behind uh, survival models. Uh, there is a, a great series of videos here for, on YouTube. It's free from Annie Kachova. It, it has helped me understand a lot of the concepts here. And she starts with very theoretical and then ends up in R, hands-on in R. So I, th I thought it was very useful and I highly recommend them. We're going to look at the, the type of survival model we're going to look at is a little bit unconventional. It's a random forest survival model. It has the advantage of capturing nonlinearities uh, in your data and is all, it's also very fast because a random forest is very easy to distribute right out to work on multiple threads, multiple cores and clusters. So uh, I found it to be very fast and I work with big, big, big data sets. So I need fast models. This one is from the Ranger package install if you don't have it and um, you need a survival package as well. So I'm going to create, let's take a quick peek at the survival model first, just straight survival. And so we're going to create a formula like you would do for any models, um, except here you have to pass the two 
uh, outcome variables are time-based and whether the event happened or we don't know. And then these are all the predictors, right? So everything else is fairly standard. And let's run this model. It's very fast. And we can look at the coefficients of the model, the, of the model importance. And you got to take this with a, with a grain of salt because, you know, we're not splitting the data, right? We just put everything in. So you can see that, uh, you know, negatively predictive is the IV drug. The more IV drug, um, you know, the less, the lower your chance of survival. And the higher you are on a Karnofsky scale, which is a scale of health, it goes from 100 down. The higher you are, the healthier you are, the better it is. So that's a predictive coefficient here, predictive predictor, a, a, a positive predictor. Um, also, some, uh, one thing you need to remember with a survival model, you're predicting the, the, the probability of non-event meaning surviving the event. So it doesn't matter if the event is, is death or life, you're predicting not reaching that event. In this case, it's the AIDS diagnosis or death. You're predicting the survivorship of not getting either one of those. And, and here, we're going to uh, plot. Some survival times for two patients. So we're looking at patient one, well, basically um, uh, uh, row one and patient on row 56. So you see patient one is that orange line. I don't probably it's very small for you here, but you see the patient one's chance of surviving, of not reaching event is very high, right? Through Throughout all the days in the model. Patient blue, not so good, right? By, by right around, you know, 300, that chance is around 50-50. So 50.5 uh, probability of surviving. And we can look at why, or try to kind of infer why the model picked those by looking at those two patients. So you can see patient number one has a, um, a Karnofsky, uh, how do you, let me make sure I say it correctly, the Karnofsky performance scale, and there's a link there if you're interested in it. Um, the Karnofsky scale is high, so it's as high as you can be, 100 is a top. So this one has a very high Karnofsky scale, which is very positive, and is only 34 years old. This one is a little bit lower, and is, you know, uh, twice the age, right? So 63. So those are, you know, probably factors that go into the model that, making, that, that, that are making the probability over time go down faster for uh, the patient on a row 56. We can create these, 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 you know, these interesting graphs by plotting, all, by plotting a lot of these. And um, here, we can do it quickly here. There. So here we have, we've put, what, 98 page, we've, we've plotted 98 probabilities 98 patients and their uh, chances of surviving over time. Okay, so we're going to use the area under this curve to help us measure uh, our model. So we're going to have to extract an area under the curve out of an, a survival model, which, you know, it's not that complicated, but it takes a little bit of thinking. And we're going to, so, so we can come compare it with a classification. And getting an AUC out of classification model is trivial. Here it's, it's uh, the, the, um, you know, in, in the survival model, we're going to have to make some choices. So. I'm going to start by taking our, um, our data set, right, our AIDS trials data set, and splitting it in two, two equal parts. And one I'm calling uh, the training portion, and the other I'm going to call the validation portion, right? So more or less equal amount of rows in each. And to start off, let's get a, an AUC score on our uh, classification model before we, we tackle the survival model. So for a classification model, we need to create a, an outcome variable, right? And we don't have one, right? We have a sensor and we have a time base. So we're going to use both of those to create an outcome variable of something happening in a period of time. So we're going to choose our period of choice is going to be um, 80, 82 days out from, from zero to 82. We're going to say, what is the probability of these patients getting uh, um, an AIDS diagnosis or dying within the first 80 sec 82 days, right? So that's, how, that's, what, that's what we're going to do with our classification model. So I'm creating a variable to hold my, my choice of data, my, my, my number of days. And this is a list of all the days that we could choose from, right? We could model from, you know, day one to day 364. So I'm picking 82 here. So it's going to be, what are the chances of getting an AIDS diagnosis or dying within this highlighted area, the blue area? And now we're going to create this outcome variable. Very simple. 
um, I'm going to create, I'm just taking a copy of my official data set. I'm going to call it uh, train underscore df underscore classification. And I'm going to say, I'm going to create this new variable called reached event. And I'm going to say, if in my, my training my data set, there is a sensor of one, meaning we've reached the event, and the time is equal or under my period of choice, so equal or under 82 days, then we give it a one, else we give it a zero, right? And we're going to do the same thing for the validation portion. Okay, and we see here we have about 4.5% um, that have reached event in 82 days for our testing, for our training, and about 3% for our testing. So these are very skewed data sets, but in the medical field, that happens often when you're looking at disease or sickness, right? They're rare, thankfully, they're rare events, right? So it's always going to, you always end up with a very skewed data set, and they're tough to work with. And the AUC is great for measuring skewed data sets. Okay, so now let's run the model. So I'm going to create a feature names, which is going to hold all the predictors. Because this is getting tricky here, right? Because we have a lot of peaking variable now. I created one, which is going to be our official outcome variable called reached event. But we have time and we have sensor. And we don't want those in the model, right? Because they're peaking now. So we have to remove them. We're not going to remove them, but we're not going to include them part of our feature, part of our features, our predictors. So our predictors are only going to be, you know, these things, right? Part, and nothing that gives away whether they've reached an event directly or the time. And you're gonna to have to, we're using the GBM library, so you have to install the package if you don't have it. And that's very straightforward. So I'm just gonna go down to uh, when we calculate the uh, area under the curve, and we're gonna use the PROC library to, to get the score. So, you know, go ahead, install it if you don't have it. So interesting is GBM is a little bit slower than the, the, the random forest sur uh, survival model. And here we have it, right? So we got a, a 0.771 AUC, 0.77 AUC, uh, with the data set we have and the training data that we used to model whether somebody or not will uh, reach an HIV patient will reach uh, uh, will get an AIDS diagnosis or die within 80, 82 days. So now we're going to do the same thing, but on our random forest survival model. So here it's a little bit maybe a little bit slightly more tricky. So first thing you do is you run your survival model. Exactly like we did earlier with the survival model, except now we're not going to do it on the entire database. We're just going to do it on our training portion. And as you see, we're passing the survival formula. If you don't remember what it was, it's time sensor and the same predictors we had in the in the the random for uh, in the the GBM model. So we pass that, pass our data set, and everything else is just typical uh, GBM, right? Typical number of trees, tries, etc. And here, we see that what it, um, the, the, the times it's offering a probability on, right? It's not continuous. If you don't have a time in your training set, it's not going to give you a probability for that time. So notice there's no four and five. There's no day four, five, six, right? So it goes from one day one, two, three, or period one, two, three, to period seven. We're missing a few. So you always have to look at the unique death times to know what probability it fits. You can't assume that row one is, uh, sorry, uh, column one is day one, column two, day two, column three. No, because they're not, it's not continuous. There are holes in here. And that's uh, uh, probably an idiosyncrasy of, of this random forest model. Um, okay, so we have that. Now we're going to predict. Same thing, you predict on a, the, our, our validation data set like we did before. And let's take a peek at the predictions. So you see, these are all the predictions for, um, this is not day 150, 153, right? 153, it's the index, the column index 150, whatever, whichever day it falls on. But these are all the probabilities for this entire time continuum that it has, that it offers. And um, um, now we can, and this is, this is how I find what day it's equivalent to. I'm using a very simple which statement. So we're saying which in survival predictions, unique death times, remember that's what holds kind of uh, the column headers that we have, is equal to 82, our period of choice. And it's gonna tell you, oh, column 35 holds um, the probability of, uh, of surviving the event uh, for the first 85 days. That's what we want to pull out. So we create a predictor that way. I'm just gonna get the whole thing and we can look at it. Hopefully it will make sense. So we're saying there. So we're saying here. Um, 
the response, right? This is our, we're going to use our, um, the, the, the outcome variable we already calculated, whether we know it's true or false, we can recycle that one from the classification model. That's no, no problem. But here in a survival model, right? This is giving us a probability of surviving an event. We don't, we want the probability of not surviving the event. So we have to flip it. So I'm going one minus this survive, the, 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 the prediction of surviving uh, at period 80, um, um, I think 82nd, the, the, the first 82 days. So it's a little bit complicated. We have to flip it. So now we're predicting the event and not the non-event. And then we can compare that with our outcome variable because the outcome variable of one is the same thing. It's predicting something happened within 80, um, 82 days, right? And we are then, um, uh, so the survival model for uh, the, the, you know, the first 82 days, right? I'm gonna make sure that's what, what the period is. Yeah. So we have a 0.753 AUC score of predicting whether some, some a patient uh, will reach event in the first 82 days, right? So it's not as good as our um, classification model, which was 0.77, right? So, but what happens if we blend them together? We're simply blending them. I'm simply going to take the probabilities of one, add it up to the probabilities of the other and dividing it by two and see if that helps out. No, oh, we get a 7583. So still not as good as just a classification model on its own. So, um, and again, I'm, I'm suspect that this is still a good approach if you have enough data. I just think that the data set is very thin and that's a problem with, 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 with the data. But you should hopefully get the, the idea of blending in a survival model, picking a period out of the survival model and then being able to compare it, flipping it and comparing it to a classification model. But before I end, I want to do something else. I want to look at a, a true ensemble uh, uh, model. So what we're going to do here, and it's a little bit complicated, so if you don't quite get it, you know, go through the, the, the material and try to do it on your, on your own. It will help. We are going to um, create, we're going to, we're going to split our data into smaller chunks, right? Remember, we have two data sets so far, training and validation. We're going to split each into two so we can create a, a survival prediction, a prediction from the survival model for the all everything, for all our training data and all our testing data without cheating, without peaking. And then we're going to take that prediction for, uh, uh, in our case, uh, the for the first 82 days and inject it back into our classification model as a new feature, right? It's going to be the survival model as a new feature and see if it helps uh, the classification model, right? Directly by, by, by injecting it directly into the model. So, First thing we're going to do is split our data sets again. So here we're splitting it straight, you know, 50-50, uh, uh, our training data sets. So now we have two training data sets. Uh, let me make sure I'm doing this right. Yep. So now we have one, we have train underscore one, which has 267 rows and train underscore two, which has 301 rows. And we're going to do the same thing for our validation. Split it in two. So now we have uh, four data sets, right? Train one, train two, test one, test two. So now bear with me here. It's a little bit complicated. It's, it's not complicated. It's just, uh, you know, you just got to follow. We're going to create two survival models where the first one, we're going to use our first training portion, train one, and predict on train two, and test two. A second survival model, we're gonna take our training two and predict on train one and test one. Like this was just these two models, we'll quickly be able to get predictions for everybody, including the training, without ever cheating. That's the key, right? We never wanna peak, otherwise you're gonna get in inflated numbers. And you'll know if you cheat, right? If it just jumps some astronomical amount, you know you did something wrong. So let me run this. I'm not gonna talk about it, go too much details here because it's, it's a bit uh, tedious. Just go, if you, if you, you know, walk through it again afterwards. Because now we're using two separate, we split our training data into two, um, and the random forest survival model only predicts on days uh, it has a trained on, you have to make sure that both data sets have the period you're interested in. So we know uh, uh, survival number, model two has 80, 80, uh, 82 period, and survival one has 82 period. So we're good there, but you have to check. Sometimes it won't have this say, you know, it won't have it. Let me see if I can find one. Yeah. So here, first one has one, two, three. The second one has one, seven, 14. So right off the bat. So we don't want to take those dates because it's going to complicate things, those periods. Okay. So we ran out two models. 
Now we need to bring our predictions back together and it's a little bit uh, tedious. We're going to create train2 ensemble where we take um, the, the actual train2 data set and we add the, the predicted um, train2 data to it. Make sure I'm doing this correctly. There we have it. And we're calling it survival probabilities. So if you look at our data now, we now have what we had before, time, sensor, treatment, etc., etc., etc. And now we have this new feature called survival probabilities, and where we re-injected the predictions from the survival model inside this data set. So we have an augmented data set. And now we're going to do the same thing for um, the test two. Now we're going to work on train one ensemble and test one ensemble. Let me just do everything in one go here. And finally, we're going to create our original training data set and our original validation data set by bringing train one ensemble and train two together by row binding them and doing the same thing for our validation. So now we're going to go back to the original two data sets we had. But they're now, if we can take a quick peek here, right, we they now all have a new feature call survival probabilities. Okay, so now we're going to enjoy what we just did, right? So we have to recreate our um, outcome event, right? Because we've changed, we've changed things around. So we're just going to recreate it. We're going to say in this new uh, uh, final data set, reached event if the sensor is one and we're under the period, uh, equal or under the period of interest. So about 4% 4, 4 still, 4.4, .4, so exactly like before. And same thing for our validation set, but now there. And now we're going to run the final model. So again, I'm going to do the same thing as I did before, right? I'm going to make sure we pull out um, our survival data, time and sensor. And I'm going to create a formula just to kind of bring the point home. The formula is reached event, true or false, under 82 days. And these are all our variables. And notice that the last is a new feature, a new predictor at the end, survival probabilities, right? Okay, now we simply need to run it and see if it helps or not. Okay, so I ran it all and I'm getting a 0 .7, uh, 0 0.7971 AUC. So not bad, right? We, uh, we got a little bit of a boost. Keep in mind that um, the data set is so small and the data set is skewed that um, you change your period, you're going to get different, uh, different results. The idea here is that I, I believe that uh, ensembling, injecting that data back into your data set is pretty useful. And if you, if you can stack diverse models, like a survival with a classification and other ones, maybe add in a linear model, add in a neural network, right? And then you can stack these new features inside the data set, you should get um, hopefully a better accuracy, a higher accuracy uh, with this type of data. 